Good morning, everyone. So today we're talking about thiamine in Lake Huron and Michigan Lake Trout. So what I'm going to do here first is provide some background <laughs> on, on thiamine deficiency. And then I'm going to report the trends in egg thiamine levels from Lake Huron and Michigan Lake Trout through last year. So some of you have seen this stuff before, so please bear with me. I'd like to provide background for people that don't understand or don't have, aren't familiar with the uh, thiamine problem itself. So thiamine is also known as vitamin B1. It's an essential cofactor for a bunch of enzymes and a bunch of uh, metabolic pathways, in particular the, the Krebs cycle, which is a carbohydrate metabolism. So animals that don't have sufficient thiamine can't metabolize carbohydrates or sugar. You know, they can't metabolize sugar. And so that's an, an important energy pathway for in all animals. So um, it's a big problem. Uh, thiamine is also involved in nerve function, although its role in nerve function, I believe, is less well understood. And it's also an antioxidant. So it plays a number of roles in, in the metabolism. Um, so what happens when you have thiamine deficiency is it results in disease in many animals, including humans. It's called beriberi in humans. It's also observed in a variety of animals, foxes, minks, dogs, cats, chickens, alligators, wild birds, fish, etc. This is a picture of a, of, a, of a captive fox that has suffered from thiamine deficiency. So one of the symptoms is you just tend to have no energy and you just sort of lay around because you can't metabolize sugar. You need to, a fuel you need to burn, you know. Um, it's been called chastec paralysis after a guy who found it. So a lot of times when you have these domestic animals like minks or or foxes, you know, people feed them sometimes fish because it's a cheap feed. And when they feed them stuff like ground up herring for a week at a time, sometimes they all get sick and then all you have to do is give them thiamine and they get better really quickly. Um, so this thiamine deficiency has been common in a lot of uh, salmonines in the Great Lakes. We it used to be called EMS, early mortality syndrome, but then they realized that, you know, it happens in other life stages. It was first observed in, in you, know, you know, fry. Uh, and so, but they, it's been observed in adults since, so it's the name thiamine deficiency complex is um, is probably a better name. So recently in uh, New York State, this has popped up as a big problem just this last few months, where um, steelhead have been coming back to rivers, particularly the Salmon River in New York, and uh, are dying at the mouth of the river, and they're also they're acting weird, and, and they can't swim, and they're sort of swimming around strange ways. And these are adult steelhead, you know. So there's been a lot of press about this in New York State. And um, DEC now, New York State DEC, is actually going out to the rivers and injecting sick fish with cyanide, you know, as a stopgap measure to get their brood stock. So they needed to get brood stock, and they were worried they weren't going to get enough fish. So they're actually going out there now, and there's these sick fish sort of floating down the river, and they go out and grab them, and stick them a needle in them, and inject them with time. Then they recover within hours, and then they go on their way. You know, but this is kind of a, a kind of a radical sort of way to approach the problem. You know, you're out there with people with needles in the rivers every year. I don't know if that's you know a sustainable program, but uh, it shows you that this stuff pops up here. You know, it's been observed in some adult fish. So there was some work done with, I believe, Coho in New York State, where they. Um, they injected some fish with thiamine and they made it up much further in the river and were healthier and spawned and stuff. Um, but the way the problem usually manifests itself in, in Salmonids in the Great Lakes is through the eggs. So it's usually a problem where the females, adult females, don't have sufficient thiamine. And then when they allocate the thiamine, so at some point during egg development, the female allocates thiamine into the eggs. She doesn't have enough thiamine in her body to put it into the eggs, and the eggs end up thiamine deficient, and then when they hatch, they, they have various symptoms, they swim funny, they, they die right outright at some point, you know. Um, but usually this is the way we see it happening. This is what's been happening in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. So yeah, so the, the low thiamine in, in the tissues or eggs is, is sometimes also a result, it could be a result of just not enough thiamine in your diet, and this is often what happens with people, I think, with very very, but um, it's also caused by this thing called thiamines, which is an enzyme that breaks down thiamine, you know. And so it occurs in some prey fishes, particularly in alewife. But the, the levels of thiamines in fish are so weird, they're, they're not stable. I mean, you can go from one place, through seasonally you see changes in different species, alewife in particular. If you go from place to place, um, you see ver wide variation in thiamines. So nobody really knows why. 
polyaminase is there or where it comes from, actually. But um, Allison Evans, who used to work for the commission, now she works at Oregon State, she's been doing some work and it suggests that the elk actually produced the thiamine themselves. We thought it was coming from the, the food web, perhaps. Um, maybe certain diet items, like zooplankton or something, would have thiaminase in them and then it would build up in, in elk. But it now appears that they're actually making it themselves. And so one of the theories is that that the food web disruptions in the Great Lakes may have caused some physiological uh, syndrome that would cause the airwife to produce more thiaminase. Say, for example, fatty acid deficiencies. The diets might change, and they, they, the airwife might have a deficiency of the, the good omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, and they, may, and they may have some physiological mechanism to, to adjust for that by producing thiaminase. And we, so, it's really we're not understood at all why this happens, but there's some theories about it, you know. But nevertheless, anyway, thiamine, thiamine occurs in these alewife, and it affects light trout reproduction, we believe, to the point where it may be an impediment to the restoration. So the you know light trout in lakes that have high thiaminase in their diet and then have low thiamine in their eggs, uh, that may be a major impediment to restoration of populations. So the effects of low thiamine. It, these also vary among different species, but for lake trout, there's been several pieces of work that suggest that below 1.4 nanomoles per gram in the egg, you get outright mortality. All those fry will die. And then below 4 nanomoles per gram, you get these sublethal effects, which is the trout, the fry grow more slowly. They have difficulty at capturing prey. They have difficulty avoiding predators and they have compromised immune function. Now these are a little bit more difficult, I mean, to determine the effects. Most of those will probably result in, in fry mortality eventually, at combined, you know. But, so the level that's considered um, what you want to have in, in the eggs is four nanomoles per gram. Below that, you start to have some kind of problems. Not necessarily direct mortality right away, but perhaps eventually indirect effects on mortality. So this program, USGS has been monitoring lake trout egg thiamine now for about 14 years or something. It was originally started by Dale Honeyfield, who's uh, at our USGS Leetown Science Center in Pennsylvania. He was invited out here to start looking at thiamine levels in lake trout eggs when it was determined. See, this, this mortality used to occur, when it began to occur, people didn't know what it was. People thought it might have been contaminants, and eventually it was John Fitzsimons and a fellow over at Cornell, I believe, uh, Jeff Fisher, who determined that this was a thiamine problem. So then, after that, people started wanting to look into it. So Dale started doing it, and then about 2005, um, I took over coordinating the egg collections, and, and then the analyses were done initially by Jacques Rinchard at SUNY Brockport, but now uh, Don Tillett at our USGS CERC lab in Columbia, Missouri, is actually doing the, doing the analyses now. And we get our eggs from a variety of, of agencies around Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. And without these people collecting these eggs during spawner surveys and giving them to us, we wouldn't be able to do this work. So this work is really you know, a result of the cooperation with all these agencies together. These are the sites that we monitor at around Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. So all the dots there. So here's the lake, um, lake thiamine levels for Lake Huron over the past 13 or so years. So we, you know, the samples from last year are still being analyzed. Uh, the last time I reported on this, it went up to about 2011. So the last two data points uh, at the sites where we have data for 13 are, are the new data. And on Lake Huron, the levels are still, so this dotted line here is the four animals per gram, the level that you want to have your eggs at. And all the sites in Lake Huron are still above that. So they, they, used, they started out low. You notice here, some of these sites. And then alewife crashed right about here, and then we saw an increase. But now, at some sites, it's actually coming down again a little bit. Drummond Island was really high, and it's come down a little bit. Six Feather Neck, we don't really have any new data. Thunder Bay looks like it's staying about the same. Yankee Reef's gone way up. We don't have any new data for Perry Sound. And Owen Sound looks like it's going down. None of these are really close to the limit. This one's closest, I guess, these two. But nevertheless, in Lake Huron, thiamine levels in Lake Huron eggs are still above the threshold. This is not the case for Lake Michigan. 
we started to see a similar pattern in Lake Michigan. Some of the sites looked like they were going up <coughs> early on, but now most of the sites, with the exception of Little Traverse Bay and Grand Traverse Bay, many of the sites for which we have new data are either at or below the threshold now. Now most of them have, have been, some of them have been near the threshold the whole time, some of them went up a little bit, but um, the picture right now, except with the exception of uh, the Traverse Bays, doesn't look so good. So I put together this graph just for interest sake. Um, I don't want to put too much stock into this because, and the reason I don't have error bars on these data points is because each year in each lake, the samples come from a different collection of sites. So they're not necessarily telling you the same thing. So you know, some years we don't get data from some sites. Um, so I don't want to put too much stock in this, but this is something that sort of puzzles me. You know, we sort of think that uh, the lack of alewife in Lake Huron has allowed the, the Simon levels there to go up. And it seems fairly obvious just from the timing of when the increase occurred. But I just put together some data. I put together all the data from all the sites in Huron over time in Michigan. And then I put some data from Lake Ontario. Now, the Lake Ontario data was from the first few points were from John Fitzsimons. And then the last part of the data series is from a different site that Jock Richard collected some eggs. But what's striking to me here is that all the sites, all the lakes showed an increase, a peak in 2009, and have come down. So the, all the lakes are showing a similar pattern here. And uh, that would suggest to me that it's not simply, you know, the fact that there's no alewives in Lake Huron, but that there's something at a large regional scale that's controlling the thiamin levels, either the thiaminase levels in, in alewife or the thiamin levels in Lake Huron. And I can't, for the life of me, think of what mechanism this could be, you know, what could be doing it. But I just want to show you this so, to give you the point, to show you that there's other things going on we don't understand. It's not necessarily just the fact that alewife crashed in Lake Huron because they didn't crash in Lake Ontario and they were still present in Lake Michigan and we still saw this increase in the one year in 2009. So, I, you know, there's other things going on that we don't understand. That's the point. So this shows it in a different way. You can show the proportion of the females that have eggs with um, thiamine below four animals per gram. You see, that's really low in Lake Huron, as you'd expect with the high thiamine levels. There's a couple sites, Drummond Island, that have a few females, Owen Sound, but for the most part the sites have basically zero, you know, some sites have basically zero females with low thiamine eggs, and that's a good thing. In Lake Michigan, it's not, again, not the same story. These um, later data points show that most, in some, most cases, more than half or almost all the fish, females, have eggs with low thiamine, and that's not good. This shows the, the proportion of eggs for, as a whole for, the, for Lakes here on the Michigan. Once again, no error bars because their sites each year are different. But um, just to show you a general trend, we had the, this thing in, in 09. This is the one thing I showed you before when, when they, all the lakes went up. For this one year, Lake Michigan, Lake Trout females, only around 15% of them had low egg time. And the next year, it's back up to 40. Now it's around over 60%. Whereas Lake Huron's down here somewhere around 18%. So I, last time I showed the, the the data, we had gone through 2009, and this is a way I, I showed, showed the different sites, where these sites in that year showed that they were going up or were stable, and these these sites showed where they were actually, this is going up, there was evidence they were going up, and this is where they were, they were sort of stable or going down, and the red circles showed um, areas where a high proportion of females had low egg thiamine. And so I'm going to switch forward to this data going through 2013. And the only change is we have two more sites where we have a high proportion, very high proportion of females with low, low egg thiamine. So the, the, the fact that the Traverse Bays here show um, different trends than the rest of the lake is curious to me. And I'm wondering, I mean, there's a lot of people in the room probably know more about this than me, but I'm wondering if the Forge Bay in the Grand Traverse Bay and the Little Traverse Bay is different than the main lake. I know there's evidence of Cisco being there, perhaps like Trudy Cisco, but perhaps they're eating gobies there too because the whole bays are shallower than the main lake, so gobies may concentrate there. So I'm wondering if there's any evidence. They're also geographically proximate to Lake Huron. 
So, I mean, I don't know if that has any role in it either, but I'm wondering if anyone has any data about uh, the Forge Base in, in Grand Traverse Bay, which may explain why those two sites are different than the rest of the lake. So this map, map shows the proportion of or percent of females at each site with eggs below foreign animals per gram. And you can see even though Grand Traverse Bay looks like it's doing better, it still has half of its females with low thiamine and Little Traverse has 31%. You see the rest of the lake anywhere from 50 to almost 194%. Whereas in Lake Huron there's only two sites, that means Drummond Island and Owen Sound where there are any females with less than four animals per gram. So once again, it's a story for Lake Huron, we think. We saw alewife crash, and then we immediately saw juvenile lake trout. Immediately the alewife crashed, the next survey we had, we started catching these lake trout fry, which we hadn't caught at all hardly in the past, except for these few years here where alewife were also low. So this tells us, you know, I mean, this is a pretty good evidence to me that, that you know, the alewife are, are a major cause of this problem, because as soon as we see them disappear, we start seeing natural reproduction. And of course now we've heard that a lot of these fry we observed are now recruiting to gillnet surveys and we have over half of the adults being caught in gillnet surveys in Lake Huron being wild. There's still a lot of unanswered questions, you know, so I think there's a lot more work needed on this subject. As I said earlier, we don't know where the thiamine comes from, we don't know why it's there. We don't know how it varies spatially and temporally. There's evidence that it does. We don't know what, what causes it. Now, what are the role of the trophic changes on the on the alewife physiology? I mean, are there some things that we could do to uh, prevent alewives from developing thymines in the first place? Is it something dietary? I mean, is there some thing out there causing it? We don't know. And we also don't know how widespread this problem is. I mean, it's a bigger problem. It goes beyond Great Lakes. and goes beyond Salmonids. I mean, you saw this, this stuff about... Uh, the steelhead in, in Lake Ontario now. This is a new phenomenon of the adults actually being being sick a lot. This has been observed in a variety of animals. I mean, there was evidence from the in the 2000s that the population of bald eagles on the Wisconsin River was succumbed to thiamine deficiency because they were eating alewives all winter. There's only prey they could find. It's being found in wild elk populations in Europe. It's been suggested that a whole variety of uh, species of wild birds in Europe are declining because of thiamine deficiency. One of the problems is the symptoms are difficult to distinguish from botulism. So it's a nerve, what usually ends up being a nerve funk issue in fish, and they sort of, in, in birds, they act, act erratically, they flop around, they can't hold their heads up, they can't, you know, and that's just exactly what happens with, with botulism. I mean, when you see birds dying in the wild, you automatically assume, or at least one of the first things that comes to your mind is botulism. You don't think to test for time and deficiency. So we have no idea how widespread this problem is. I mean, it still occurs in humans today. Humans have extraordinary control over their diet compared to any wild animal, and people still die to this day of, of very berry. In, in primarily in Asia, and it's usually in populations that are refugees, they have a very limited diet. And they often also consume, in Asia in particular, fermented fish paste, which could have diamonds in it. So, um, so I think, you know, this could be a bigger problem than we think. We think that it's kept back lake trout restoration in the Great Lakes for the last few decades at least, but it could be doing many more things that we don't understand. So I think we need to try to understand this better. So in conclusion, lake trout egg thiamine levels remain high in Lake Huron, but are decreasing again at most sites in Lake Michigan after a <coughs> brief sort of uptick there. Mean thiamine levels at most sites in Lake Huron or Lake Michigan are <coughs> at or below that sublethal threshold, still with the exception, as I said, of Grand Traverse Bay and Little Traverse Bay, although those sites are not completely without effects either. Oh, 16% of lake trout had egg thiamine levels below 4 in Huron and 64% overall in Michigan. And so, as I said, you know, we've seen this evidence of natural reproduction of lake trout and recruitment to adulthood in Lake Huron, which is what we've been waiting for for decades, but we don't completely understand the role of the lack of thiaminase in it. We think that's a big part of it, but we don't completely understand it. So thanks to everyone who sends us eggs, and please keep sending us eggs. We're going to try to actually expand this program now into Superior and perhaps the Lower Lakes if we can get people to send us eggs. So we're, we're trying to, we think we can use maybe um, Lake Superior data as a <coughs> sort of a control to see where we think the other lakes should be. And we can study the, very, the natural variability in a lake without thiaminase. So thanks a lot, and I'll take any questions. <coughs>